All right, welcome everybody to tonight's uh, Toast Ale Masterclass with our very good friends at Hobbs House Bakery. Uh, so Hello. welcome Henry. Hello. One uh, fabulous duo of the fabulous Baker Brothers. Um, and uh, we are delighted to, uh, to have you here with us. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about this delicious beer. Uh, I should have some branding probably. Uh, up as well um, and so I am Rob I am chief toaster uh, here at toast um, one of the co-founders uh, with Louisa uh, and uh, uh, also the the CEO of the business um, I'll be trying to sort of set the scene and keep us all in some kind of order uh, this evening um, I'm going to hand over to Stuart uh, to talk about the deliciousness of the beer. He's our uh, head brewer extraordinaire. Do you want to give us a wave, Stuart? Beautiful waving. Mm -hmm. um, and so Stuart can talk us through the brewing. Uh, anyone that's wanting the geeky detail uh, that I certainly crave, uh, then please do ask any questions uh, that you have uh, about the beer uh, as Stuart goes through, if he doesn't answer all your questions in advance. Uh, then we're going to hand over to Henry, uh, to give us uh, a little bit of a lowdown on Hobbs House um, in general uh, and the amazing work that Hobbs House Bakery are doing, um, but also uh, I think a bit of fun stuff with bread in general and some good top tips and uh, maybe you can talk through some of the surplus uh, that ended up uh, in this beer, although amazing how little surplus uh, you actually uh, create a hops house yeah. so we're, we're big fans it was almost difficult to uh, to create this beer because of the lack of surplus which is a good thing yeah uh, and then louisa um we will hand over to you to uh, remind everyone of the i guess the whole ethos of the rise up series uh, in general uh, but very specifically uh, what this beer uh, is really trying to raise awareness about um so before handing over to Stuart, um please do all sort of pour yourself a beer if you've if you've got the beer, then please pour away. Um, ideally, don't just pour yourself a blue moon or, or something um, if you don't have our wit beer in front of you. But but pour any beer you like. I guess it's uh, it's important that you've you've got a, a beer in hand if uh, if you can. Um, and so that before handing over to Stuart, Louisa, I think you're going to do some wizardry in the background. We're getting really tech on this one. If you've not joined <laughs> the previous ones, you're going to see the life cycle of toasts. Uh, virtual um events so we're going to see who's joined one of these before we're going to do a quick question so if you've joined one before um give us a yes or a no and louisa i think you also wanted me to ask something else oh yes no wait wait let's just share the results of this poll very interesting uh, it's just we give okay ninety five percent percent of people have voted, um, so I will share the results with you all. Um, Seventy five percent of people are new to this, but twenty a quarter of you have been to one before, which is really lovely to hear. That is amazing. I can't believe you came back. <laughs> <laughs> that is phenomenal news. That's a headline. Um, or right, and. Um, <coughs> I think also we want to know, you're going to have to ask the question specifically, Louisa, the bread waste question that you've got for us. Yeah, sure. Um, so we know that a lot of bread is wasted in the UK, but we just wanted to know if you have a feel for it, how much. Ooh the drum roll moment okay. to see how many people concentrate on what we pretty much tweet and instagram every day so. <laughs> <laughs> great great well the answer is 44 percent of bread up to 44 percent is wasted in the uk it's a huge amount but actually most of you um well the the no that's a most fixed. popular <laughs> answer was correct so we're getting that message across which is wonderful um but yeah, all of those numbers, obviously, are a very high percentage. Um, so, yeah, that's what we're here to talk about tonight. Amazing. Um, all right. Thank you so much. Stuart, over to you. Tell us about brewing this absolutely delicious beer, please. And just to say, um, I guess, for everyone, please do mute yourself uh, if you're not otherwise uh, talking, because otherwise, we, as much as we love you, uh, we don't want to hear your 
kitchen sort of all sort of things in the background um so uh, yeah over to stuart thanks thanks rob um yeah and welcome to those who have never been here before i suppose seeing that a bit of context um if you've not been to one of our master classes um this beer this wheat beer is actually a birthday beer for toast um if you didn't know about it we're five years old and coming around to think about the style of beer that would not only fit in with the rise up series but also would kind of be a, a celebration of that moment there was a bit of head scratching um and those that were around at the very start of toast had a uh a lightning moment or a re recollection should we say of a, of a beer brewed in brussels um with the uh, the the beer project over there so that kind of got things rolling along the way of well should we go back to belgium as an inspiration in the start um i think we very rapidly decided not to go down the route of the 12 percent beers because that might have just been a bit too crazy but <laughs> so we ended up on a, a wheat beer and there's a probably a good reason for that as well um for those that aren't aware from brewing um bread historically and we're talking about thousands and thousands of years ago here was one of the original components of, of the original fermented beers it wasn't necessarily called beer then but it was an alcoholic beverage so bread belgium well it kind of had to be didn't it we ended up with a wheat beer or as is more correctly termed in belgium a wit beer or white beer um, for those that aren't familiar with the styles uh, a white beer is so called because if you've got it in front of you you can obviously see it's a bit hazy that comes from starches uh, and the yeast that's in there so it's uh, an unfiltered beer um, it's also a little bit fizzier these days than, than most other beers because the carbonation is, is quite high and there's something else quite unique about this these these beers hark back to the days um, before brewers started looking into hedgerows and under hedgerows and stuff with these wonderful things called hops and we actually used to use spices um, different types of spices anything from sort of wood rough heather um, yarrow for example in the past but the Belgian one or well, this is because it wasn't Belgian back then it was all sort of the Flemish countries there was a lot of trade going on and there was a lot of um, exotic herbs coming in in this particular case coriander so the historical brewers and we've kind of replicated that in our beer here we've used a thing called groit uh, for those that don't know it's either spelled g-r-u-i-t or g-r-u-y-t and that refers to the mix of herbs and spices that would have been used in a beer to replace hops so in our particular wheat beer we've used coriander and we've used orange peel uh, both sourced from organic sources the orange peel was was particularly nice with the aromatics and the oils from there uh, we have had a nod to modern brewing we've used a bit of bittering hop at the front end and a wonderful hop later on in the beer called mandarina bavaria um, for those that have got any idea of, of fruits mandarina suggests what it does it's got a nice orangey kind of note to it um, our wheat beer in itself we kind of wanted to push the boat out here as well because it's it's the, it's the fifth anniversary um, typically toast will run at somewhere between 15 maybe 25 percent of the of the grist that's the barley and the wheat and the, and the bread that we use that goes into make a beer we use about 20 percent give or take uh, by weight in the in all of our beers, or at least our core beers. The wheat beer has pushed this up significantly. Um, we are, in terms of uh, input, with a little bit of wheat added, probably closer to 54% in this particular beer. Um, and it's really there as an example of, of how far you can push using bread in beer making. Um, that does create some problems. Um, so the brew house on that day was uh, rather reminiscent of a pasta. Um, house in Italy with the, the kind of a bready aromas coming off in the mash and we've got to be very very careful because when we, we mix the the grains and the breadcrumb and a little bit of wheat in there as well together if we go too hot with this it literally is bread pudding which would have been probably quite useful for the brewers on that day it was a cold day when we were making it but certainly wouldn't be much good for us today as a, as a beer um, having mixed that uh, that grist together we've got a wort and that wort goes off it's boiled um, we had a few hops in there and then we have a huge tea bag um, that we use which is the orange and the coriander and as I said that was organic and we also commented and Rob's already commented that um, the bread we've used in this is from Hobbs House as well which is obviously an organic uh, supplier so we've tried to focus on, on organic as, as much as we can but once the boil is done huge tea bag gets suspended in this wort and 
it literally, I mean, the weight when it came out, probably 15 kilos in weight, trying to pour this out of a, of a uh, boiling kettle. The beer then goes forward. We have a wonderful, friendly Belgian yeast that we've used for this uh, particular beer. We have to be careful with this particular yeast because if you let it do what it wants to, it runs off and makes flavors like TCP, and we didn't particularly want that. But if you control it, and you control the temperatures in the fermentation, you end up with sort of subtle orange notes that are coming through. Maybe a little bit of banana, but, but, but orange as well coming through there. Um, the beer itself took about 12 days to ferment down. Um, there was no dry hopping in this beer, so it's a very old traditional solid beer, unlike the sort of more modern craft beers. Um, and at the end of that 12 days, you've got a, a lovely settled beer with those orange and sort of slightly spicy notes from the coriander that are coming through. The coriander is really just there to warmth. In fact, probably treating it a bit like sort of salt and pepper in your cooking. It's just there to lift everything a little bit without being dominant or obtrusive in the, in the overall palate. Um, the beer from that point went on, it was chilled down. We left it in the tank for eight, nine days at about zero degrees. That gives it a nice maturation and then went off unfiltered, completely unfiltered. So this is the beer pretty much as it was, as it left the brew house fermenter, apart from the fact that we carbonated it a little bit up to 2.5, 2.6 volumes of gas. Doesn't mean a lot to many people, but it's about 10, 15% higher than an average beer. And that's meant to give sort of a dancing sprightliness, I suppose, or refreshing uh, nature to the beer. And particularly when you first pour it, it will generate that very dense white foamy head. Now the white foamy head, in this case, is probably all down to Hobbs Bakery from the, the stuff that we, we had that came through to us. There was a bit of a mixture of, uh, of breads and things in there. But for those that don't know, the head on a beer comes from the proteins. And in this particular case, those proteins were mainly coming or predominantly coming from that, uh, that surplus bread that we managed to, um, yeah, with Henry's help, I suppose, <laughs> Egg borrow made me feel like stealing a bit at some point because there, as Rob said, there wasn't a lot of surplus to go with at, at some points, but we got there. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of a, a brief potted history on wheat beer or our interpretation of wheat beer, and linking back to our five-year anniversary and why we went down that route for this particular beer. That's brilliant, Stuart. I'm um, I'm still adamant we should have called this beer the Fifth Element, which uh, is uh, is still my uh, absolute eagerness for a uh, a beer at some stage. Um, but uh, it's it's going to happen. Louisa just never quite lets it happen. But uh, I think we should have a poll on that at some time um, uh, as to when we can call a beer the Fifth Element. So, um, uh, Stuart, I guess one quick question I've got for you before handing over to Henry is um, so obviously this uh, and maybe Henry sort of chip in here as well as a. Uh, uh, as, a, as a baker, as a bakery chef, um, because you sort of talking about um, sort of the, the salt and pepper uh, element is, is really interesting because you often talk to me about that with adding in some of the hops um, and some hops that you'll use as a bit of a just tweak at the end. Um, but just the nature of all these limited edition beers, you're basically nailing it or you have to nail it first time uh, with, the, with the brews. So how do you yeah, how do you actually go about that? How do you sort of plan to make a brew that you've got no scope for error, um, especially with the time scale and pressure of, of a series like this where you're brewing them every six weeks? Uh, yes, it, it's that subtle art of um, mystery, artisanal approach and science, Rob. Um, there's, there's, uh, there's elements of, of flavour profiles within hops and in this case, coriander and orange and, and the the, the grist, which is the barley and the bread, that we can broadly predict. Um, and then there's elements where it's just a case of, okay, what happens if? Um, and this is a bit where we where the brewers start to use strange terms and terminology, which is pretty much they're designed to confuse those that are not brewers, to cover up the fact that our art isn't actually that difficult. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh, yeah. He's, he's underplaying uh, it. <laughs> But it's 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 mainly about the yeah it's it's the mixture. I mean it's a bit like cooking a chili at home. Um, you know if you start cooking a chili when you're sort of 18 or something, that that kind of first hit where you put too much uh, chili powder or raw chilies in or maybe too many onions or whatever it might be, you then end up refining and progressing that as you become more experienced and you, you become aware of the of the palate that other flavours and hops and things can offer you. Mm. Yeah, oh, amazing. Uh, thank you, Stuart. Brilliant. Thank so you. any more questions for Stuart, please do plug them away in the chat box. I think he can try and answer some of them 
as we go, um, but also we will we'll have time at the end. Uh, so Henry, over to you. Uh, obviously, it'll be um, fascinating to hear about your uh, sort of approach to recipe development as well and whether you yeah, just yeah. Uh, bosh things out first time or whether there's a, a, a series of trials um, and whether you're also uh, coming up with terms to uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, ramp up the craft uh like stuart's claiming uh, in the beer industry um and uh, yeah but over to you tell us all about hobbs house and uh and, and the great work you're doing yeah well firstly this is this beer is delicious so thank you for um letting us be involved and you know getting to drink some because it's yeah it's really fabulous and um uh incidentally with lockdown and everyone getting last year into sourdough baking obviously you know having done quite a lot of sourdough baking in my past um, I felt like I needed to have a go at a, a skill. So um, I, I've had a go at a bit of home brewing and it's, I tell you, it's a real rabbit warren of, um, you know, uh, you, you start Googling and before you know it, you're confused, but actually, you know, kind of going into the world and, and, um, and you know, being involved in this project has been really fascinating. And actually from a homebrew point, um, I think some of my beers have been, you know, they're not as good as this, but they've been all right. But I've tended to go for the more kind of, uh, the kind of hop heavy style but actually having drunk this i'm you know i'm feeling quite inspired to uh to, to try a, a less hoppy one but maybe use some more of those seasonings and stuff and i think it um you know hit, re reading about it it's got the coriander and the orange in my head i just assumed that would have just come from the hops but knowing that you've actually just put some coriander and, and orange in as well kind of gives me the confidence to go well actually you know you can just try that and you know try and bring those flavor notes out which i think is great but it's a delicious beer so all credit to you Stuart. thank you so i think well i think i think i think that's amazing and uh, yeah mm. echo that to uh, to mm. Stuart. but the mm. i can imagine that week during lockdown one henry where uh, everyone baked um yeah, yeah. slight <laughs> nervousness for you thinking oh god my business yeah, yeah. is ruined forever well, and then a week later realizing no one's ever going to bake again so i think the thing that turns we, out we, you're fine yeah yeah the thing that we always know is that it's all about educating people and if you can educate people if they can appreciate the craft they might not do it every time but at least they'll you know make a, a conscious decision to buy a better quality product and whether that's a beer or a bread or, or something else you know so for me education is is a big part of it and understanding the craft is really important so so my kind of dipping my toe into the world of brewing has been fantastic now I'm, I'm not about to open a brewery so don't worry but it's been really you know it's it's been a great education and something that i've enjoyed and you get to drink it so you know um what's yeah. not to love so just a little bit about hobsaw's bakery um for, for those of you who don't know so we are um a family business based in the southwest so chipping sobbery um uh, featuring on nuns on the run too um not exactly a classic film but you know we've all got to have our claim to fame so we're just outside bristol and um yeah so we are fifth generation so my great great grandfather thomas herbert started it in down Apney, just outside sirencester and um and you know we feel uh, you know as the fifth generation that we are custodians of the business and we are you know trying to build something up that will be passed on to future generations and um and uh um the what but really what kickstarted it was my grandfather david herbert um, bought a bakery in Bristol and uh, he started Herbert's Bakery which is, is still going it's not part of our um, our family anymore um, but it was um, it became quite a, um, uh, uh, an established business um, making lots of great bread um, but the area it was in Montpellier was very cosmopolitan and um, and very multicultural so there was Polish there was uh, Eastern Europeans there was Italians there was Jamaicans there was, so there was a real diverse mix of culture and people were asking for different breads so this is back in the kind of um, uh, uh, late 50s, 60s. Um, so things like rice and focaccias and olive oil and, um, and, 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 and sourdoughs and organic breads were being, were being asked of. And so my grandfather, because the customer base was there, had to you know, move away from just making the traditional kind of cobs and you know, harvester loaves to suddenly producing focaccias and, and pumpernickel and sourdough, et cetera. And, um, and I think it really put us instead that, you know, that um, there's a whole world of baking out there. And, um, and it was at a time when lots of bread was becoming very um, uh, mass produced. So there was this Chorley wood process that had been developed, um, uh, which basically meant you could make bread without using hands. And it was all very fast and very efficient. Whereas we kind of shunned that and went and, and stayed on the more kind of traditional route, which was, you know, using your hands, using time and slow fermentation, et cetera. And, um, and so that's how we kind of built our built our bakery. Um, as um, my grandfather was, a, he was a bit of a rascal, um, a, a real kind of entrepreneur, um, probably quite a chaotic person to work for. Um, uh, and one of the things that he did was that at the time, flour was the most ex expensive part of um, 
uh, of, of the baking process. So he decided to become a farmer. Um, so he, he, he bought up quite a bit of land in the Southwest and, um, and built a mill and, um, and was one of the first um, certified organic farmers uh, growing wheat and, and milling it in the Southwest. And, uh, and that kind of really started our kind of um, our passion for you know sustainability from a kind of uh, um, a, a farming point of view and, and you know an organic being right at the heart of it and and I guess you know organics having a bit of a, a, a surge which is fantastic and um, but we've kind of you know, over the last kind of 30 40 years built up a real loyal following of, of organic produce which is which is really great um, so a lot of our um, our organic produce is is uh, is comes down really is to our um, our sourdough culture so this is our um, uh, we call it the the monster um, though some people call it the mother now this is um, uh, has a birthday each year um, in June so it's 65 years old um, and it's essentially it's a living culture and it's uh, something that we feed I don't know if you can see this it, it's not very inspirational to look at but it's essentially organic rye flour and water and we feed it every 12 hours and essentially it's the 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 the, the living yeast that's in the air it's on the flour and it feeds every day and it creates a, um, a very, um, uh, um, uh, essentially a culture of, of yeast and uh, lactobacilli, which is the, um, the kind of the sari flavor. And um, it's very stable. Um, so you don't have to worry about too much. As long as you feed it, it's like, um, it's like, a, like, a, like a child, you know, as long as you keep it, keep it well fed, it'll, uh, it'll keep growing. And, um, and this small amount of um, sourdough, if we keep feeding this, you could feed the world. You know? So it's, um, it's more virile than Facebook. And actually, over the lockdown, we've been uh, selling these online. So if you don't want to start your own one, you can buy them from our website. And um, and you know, to kind of help people to get into uh, sourdough baking. But um, but from this, so we feed it, and then we add organic flour. So I've got a, I've got a loaf here, and then we produce these beautiful sourdoughs. So this is um, our organic wild white. Um, so it's only got four ingredients. So it has uh, 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 organic white flour, the organic rye flour that's in the sourdough, and then water and salt. So that's all there is. There's no preservatives. There's no sugars or vinegars or additives, etc. And it's, it's slowly mixed, and then it's um, uh, hand molded into um, cane baskets, and then it's left to um, uh, ferment for about 24 hours, and then it's baked on the sole of the oven, so you get that nice kind of bottom base and, uh, and that beautiful lovely crust and for me this is kind of bread at its um uh it's, it's most simplest but also the most beautiful because it, it um you know it's it i just you you can't smell this but this smells amazing and um and it's the kind of bread you just want to kind of you know uh warm it up rip it up and just you know uh you know have it with cheese or butter or you know marmite or dunk dunk into a stew etc and um and uh, yeah, absolutely fabulous. Hey, so you're for us, punishing oh, us, this just sounds. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll have, I'll have a little. I'll kind of tear some. I'll get kind of biblical. I've left the knife downstairs. Um, but you can, you can see with the sourdough, you've got this really beautiful kind of open, open kind of crumb, and that is through the long, slow fermentation. So um, yeah, loads of great flavour in there. And um, now, obviously, for us, um, we, we make, we make bread. We make it to order. You know, so we are. Um, uh, um, you know, we have a really good customer base and, um, and, but obviously what we don't want is, is waste bread, you know, and, um, and, uh, um, so part of us, our, our journey has been going, um, uh, becoming a, a B Corp, um, which obviously I know Toastar and this whole rise up has been part of that. Um, and I think for us, it's been a, um, it's kind of affirmed, um, some of the things that we already were doing. So, you know, kind of how we look at our business. So it's, you know, yes, we're a business and we, you know, we try to make a profit, but it's not just about profit. It's about, you know, the people we work with and our customers and our suppliers and the whole kind of the whole, uh, you know, the holistic view, but also it's good to have, um, I guess, something a bit more official that makes you ask the difficult questions and goes, you know, could you be doing better here? And I think for us, B Corp has been a really great um, uh, way of kind of asking us those difficult questions to, because it's, you know, it's easy when you've got a business that's well established that you can rest on your laurels and actually, you know, that's something that we don't want to do, particularly, you know, as f there is pressure for having a, f being a fifth generation business owner that you don't then screw it up. You, you know, it's a, what they always say is like the, you know, the first generation build it, second one enjoys it, third one screws up, you know, so really we, we, we've got to make something for the, the sixth generation, the seventh generation, etc. But waste bread is, you know, it, it's such a, it's such a crime when you've got such be beautiful bread and you you know how much effort and time has gone into making that to then that go in the bin so for us um the first thing we try and do with waste bread is to repurpose it so whether that's 
um, supporting a local charity or someone like Fair Share or um, the Matthew Tree product in Bristol. So bread that comes back from our shops or, or has been made in the overs, um, we will then freeze down and then it will go to people, you know, for you know, people to eat because it's, you know, it's good bread. Um, uh, you know, whether we use it for bread puddings, etc. Um, the, the absolute last resort is it goes to the pig farmer. So we have some very happy pigs that, um, that feed on the bread. So nothing goes to landfill. But for me to, to use surplus bread and make it into beer is, um, is, it's just crazy. Like, um, I've, I've, uh, there's, 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 you know, I've got lots of recipe books, and there's lots of in lots of baking ones. There's lots of beer bread, so you get beer and you make bread out of it. And for me, that was always it felt wrong because if I've got a delicious beer, why on earth would I want to pour it into bread? I want to drink the beer. So to make bread into beer, you're like, wow, it's just it's utter genius. And um, and so I couldn't be more thrilled to be, you know, part of a project that takes, you know, the bread that that that, that we've made at our bakery that is going to be wasted and then create something that's as delicious as this. I just think it's astounding. And, <laughs> that's uh, long, that's a, long may it last. Thanks, Henry. And so when you've done your, um, your home brews, um, yes. have you put any surplus bread into? Uh, into well, I, 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 so I've had one go at doing a surplus bread um, beer because I, and I actually followed the recipe on your website. I didn't have all the right hops, but I, I kind of, yeah, yeah, you know, um, I kind of shim it, shim it around, but I followed the technique and it, um, it came out really nicely. The only thing is, is I, I over-carbonized it um, before I bottled it. So it's incredibly explosive, which means that when you take the lid off, uh, most of it goes up in the air. So, but I, I'm now, I think I'm on batch 11, maybe. Uh, my wife says that I drink far too much beer and I need to slow down, but it's, uh, I feel like it's a good hobby. And um, I've since learned how to not over-carbonize the, the beer. So they're slightly more drinkable but um but i'm i'm certainly gonna try um this kind of wheat style beer is it for me it feels like a, a like a um a much nicer hoe garden is it is that the kind of i'm i'm, I'm that was that was that was almost the brief i would say the entire okay. team gave stuart so uh yeah you've yeah. <laughs> you've probably okay uh, fine yeah yeah well hit, it's hit, hit the nail on the head in yeah, terms well, of it's the much nicer yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly going to give it, give it, give it, uh, give it a go. Um, yeah, particularly yeah. Uh, yeah, that orange and the, um, the um, coriander. I think coriander is such a, it's such a fantastic spice. It's got that lovely kind of lemony kind of flavor that um, I think obviously we associate it with curry, but actually, um, you know, it, it's quite often used in pâtés. And it, if you, if you eat like a kind of um, a French pâté, it quite often has coriander in it. And it just gives it that nice kind of like zesty, zesty flavor, which just kind of, I don't know, I, I think it's lovely. It's beautiful. Well done. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Henry. And um, I think we've popped the website um, uh, on there as well for anyone that wants to buy the uh, uh, the starter, the sourdough yeah. starter. Um, and uh, we'll see if we can get the second wave of uh, home baking. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'll, could we have a cookery school and it's reopening in May, I think. So, you you know, if you, you, you want to uh, do some bacon, come along. And, and I think to ask a question on behalf of everyone, because everyone will be uh, absolutely dying to know whether there are uh, kids uh, in the family uh, lined up to take over the family business already uh, as well is there is there anyone that's looking remotely promising as a, as well, a young we, baker well there's we've got um I've, i have a niece b who um who works in one of our shops um and she's been doing some pretty good home bakes at home so you know there's always but there's uh, one thing there's there's a lot of us so we we can have a few duffers it doesn't matter because there's a <laughs> <laughs> it's a, yeah we're um, from a big family so you don't need to worry <laughs> That's great. Uh, all right. Thank you so much. So yeah, any questions uh, that you have for uh, Henry, any questions for Stuart, please do keep uh, popping them in the chat. Um, so Louisa, uh, over to you. So to talk us through a little bit more about just the Rise Up campaign for those that are new uh, to the campaign in general, uh, but also what we're doing here with raising awareness about rivers and uh, maybe the Real Bread campaign, who are also a fantastic partner uh, of the series. So um, yeah, over to you, Louisa. Thank you. So yeah, we launched Rise Up um, uh, last year, so at the end of the year. Um, it's a, our campaign uh, to raise awareness of what we mean by the broken food system um, and to also inspire action to, to fix it. Uh, we're launching a series of different beers with fellow B Corp. So um, thank you so much, Henry, for talking about B Corp and what it means to you. It, it um, plays a really huge role in, uh, in us at Toast. Um, we became the first brewery in the UK to become a certified B Corp. 
um, three years ago. We're going through the recertification now. Um, and it's been really wonderful to be part of a community of businesses that all share this ambition for a, a better planet for people um, as well. Um, so Rise Up is our way of in, in bringing together lots of businesses who are all working to um, to, to change the world really, to, to create a better world. Um, and each of those beers that we're launching focuses on a different environmental impact. Uh, so we've already, through the beers that we launched last year, uh, we've talked about forests. We did a chocolate stout with Divine Chocolate. We launched one just at the very beginning of this year, actually. Thank you, Tom, for showing off the chocolate stout. Tom's got the full range. Um, we, uh, we launched a, a low alcohol beer at, right at the beginning of this year with tea pigs uh, that was focused on the oceans, um, talking about plastic in particular, um, but also other um, impacts that we're having on the oceans through overfishing and the fishing practices. Um, that we use. And for this beer, um, our, as we've talked about, our really um, important celebratory beer for toast with our, our fifth birthday and coming back to, um, to bread as a topic, um, we're focusing on rivers and we were so, so delighted um, to have Hobbs House um, as our key partner for this, uh, for this beer. We've known uh, the team for quite a number of years now and really admired everything that, that they do. Um, so yeah, really fantastic to have them on board. So for this, this beer, we're talking about rivers, um, rivers that play such a vital role in healthy ecosystems. They're home to so much abundance um, of life. If you've ever walked down a countryside river, you know, you will hear the birds, you will um, you know, see the insects hovering above the water. You'll hopefully see little fishes in the water as well. Um, everything that is that's, um, happening around that ecosystem, it's really buzzing with life. The rivers also provide food and drinking water for many species, including us um, as humans. And they also play an important role in helping us to manage the impact of climate change. So um, the effects that, um, of climate change, um, because they hold and they store water, they're helping us to manage droughts um, and floods as well to, to get that balance right. But unfortunately, the, our rivers, many of them in the UK, are in a very poor state. Um, and this is in a large part due to industrial agriculture. Um, the uh, big scale farms apply lots of chemicals to the land, um, pesticides and fertilizers, and also manures and, and slurries. And ultimately, these chemicals end up in our water systems, either through rains, they um, are washed into the rivers, through the groundwater as they soak down, um, or in times of drought when um, there is wind, that topsoil is blown up and some of that ends up in the river systems as well. Um, and that um, abundance of nitrogen and phosphates encourages um, the plants and algae to overproduce. Um, and they use up oxygen as, as they decay. So they're removing oxygen from the water, which is killing um, all of those wonderful species that, that we love that, that live in the rivers. Um, and also, you know, polluting um, drinking water um, as well. And ultimately, all of our rivers lead to the oceans. And so we um, are creating these dead zones. We've got about 400 um, coastal um, areas that are essentially dead zones that are a result of chemicals from river systems but there's so much hope because our rivers are by nature because they flow their their dynamic systems they can recover um, we we need to clean them up and restore those rivers and then you know turn off that tap as well to stop the pollution going into those rivers um, we can do that through, um, I mean, a simple thing, one of the, you know, Toast's main um, mission is about reducing food waste. We are wasting about a third of all of the food that we produce all around the world. And so we're essentially overproducing and overtaking from the earth. So by reducing food waste, we can immediately and quite easily and enjoyably um, reduce the impact that we're having, but also by supporting farming that is more um, regenerative 
to the land so organic principles for example that that Henry talked about so well as well um, so um, we're really proud to uh, be talking about rivers with this beer and the importance of that and if you wanted to find out any more about rivers or forests um, or oceans or any of the future beers that are coming up you can go to toastale.com forward slash rise up and find out more amazing thank you louise and i think the very sort of specific tangible call to action for those that aren't aware we want to go to toastale.com forward slash rise up and then or just go to toastale.com and find the link it's at the top it's even easier um and then uh, we, we could write to your local mp right that's the kind of specific tangible call to action as well Right, yeah. So as well as being consumers and, you know, having the power to influence change by the choices of the things that we buy, how we spend our money, we're also citizens and we have members of parliament that represent us. Um, so we're asking people to write to your MP. We've um, got a really simple form at the bottom of that Rise Up page on our website. Uh, we just enter your postcode and they'll, the form will find your local MP. It will give you a, a pro forma email that you can send that you can edit as much as you want we're asking mps really to stand up for the planet for nature and climate and food policies and um, particularly in the lead up to uh, cop 26 which is the coming together of governments from all over the world in glasgow in november um, talking about climate change so we 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 really want to push for change this year it's a really pivotal pivotal year perfect and it's uh, so it's kind of a, a pre-written letter you can tweak it yourself if you want to personalize it give your local mp your life story go for it um but we've also just pre-written everything that you need to hopefully capture and send through uh, and so yeah I mean, some of you on this call will no doubt have uh, very influential mps and, and ministers uh, as your local members of parliament so please do um and uh, yeah we would love to uh, influence change uh, that way um so uh, I think now that everyone has tasted uh, the beer, uh, I would love to know what everyone thinks of it. So I know not all of you will have the beer in front of you, but I'm hoping most of you who have heard about this uh, will have heard about it through maybe an involvement with the beer. Um, so Louisa, are we gonna, uh, we're not gonna ask Tom because last time I asked Tom, <laughs> it was a huge mistake. He just cast one of our beers in the past, but we'll just, we'll, 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 we'll just, you know, roll over He that made one. up for but it afterwards. He did, he did. He, did. Um, he was very so, kind. And, and so um let, let me jump in here though let me jump in um, <laughs> don't let him jump in rob <laughs> no i know it's a huge error I, I haven't got any questions really but i have got praise so first of all i want to say um henry thank you that was a great introduction um and i can see why you and your business hobbs bakery are a good fit for toast um oh can you still hear me it says my connection is unstable we can, can hear me yeah, yeah. cool so yeah, I can see why you're a you're a great fit, and um, I can see that yeah why you know yourself and the business and you represent your business really well. And I really enjoyed your introduction, and I've kind of learned some more about the things you're up to. I don't bake myself, but maybe I, like you've um, started dabbling in homebrew. Maybe I should start dabbling in baking some sour sourdough bread on the on the back of your um, enthusiasm. The whole world out there. <laughs> but about this beer. Um, you, you you know that I'm one of your biggest fans. I, I even have, um, it, oh, he's over there, he's a bit shy, but I have a cat called Toast, um, just to uh, just to give you some degree of, oh, he's, I said, t he's walking over here, but he's a bit shy. He might jump up on the table, but this isn't, oh, he's jumped up on the table because I started saying his name. He's literally just by the, I'm going to grab him. He's, he'll, he'll jump away. Say hello. Oh, that's toast. Um, but getting back to the beer, um, technically, this is this is one of the best toast. This is one of the best beers toast have ever made. This is an absolutely brilliant beer. Um, and I I don't have a brewing background, so I'm not saying that from a a particular particularly technical knowledge. I'm saying it from a, um, a fan of balanced beers. And there's some really strong flavors, some really powerful flavors in here that are balanced really well. And I think that, after, that peppery aftertaste is, is a masterclass in how to brew this style of beer. So congratulations, Stuart and the team. 
Um, so like I say, I haven't really got any questions. I just think um, the, the, the balance of this beer overall is really, really good. So yes, I was a bit um, critical of the last <laughs> beer, um, but this one, like I say, I've, I'm a fan of all of the beers um, and the more core range as it were. But in terms of these specials, um, this, uh, well, the chocolate stout, can you send me some more? Because I just keep drinking it. It's so <laughs> still good. on the Save website, this. still available to buy. <laughs> so for those that, yeah, so for, yeah, those, yeah. That, for those that don't know. Yeah, so thank, thank you, um, Thomas. So for, those, for those that don't know, so Tom is, uh, yeah, host of Craft Beer uh, Hour on social media. So from like nine till 10 every Tuesday, you can check out Craft Beer Hour. And so uh, an absolute sort of craft beer connoisseur and a good friend of Toast. And so, yeah, the, the, the sort of background is that I asked for his input on lemongrass lager last time. Uh, and I'd say he gave a lukewarm reaction and then uh, <laughs> seemed to backpedal yeah. later on social media yeah. to try and make it, up for it. It grew on me. It definitely grew on me. But that <laughs> Here we go. This is the nature of the last conversation as well. <laughs> <laughs> Let's find out what everybody else thinks. Yeah. So, so yeah. So out of, so one to five, what does everyone think of this beer? Five being the best beer you've ever tasted, really enjoyed it. And then one being... Uh, dishwater so uh, um, <laughs> one to five please for what it's worth I'm uh, on to my second so you know these we can tell terrific <laughs> beers I really enjoyed them <laughs> thank you Tom okay we've got 46 percent of people have voted a couple more minutes we'd love to hear what everyone thinks perhaps maybe um, people have not tried it yet yeah, yeah, yeah. So don't so just let's... give it a three if you haven't tried it. Just, uh, <laughs> just, don't, just don't vote. Okay, I think there's no movement. So a great result. Um, there we go. I'll share those results. So right. really, really great result. Yeah, thank you. Ah, thank you. Well done, Stuart. A round of applause for Stuart. Fantastic <laughs> beer. Um, all right, brilliant. Well, um, I guess I, don't, I haven't seen any questions that haven't been answered and uh i was sort of eager that people have tuesday nights to uh uh crack on with and wild parties planned and craft beer hours to attend uh, and so um any i guess quick hand up if there are any questions i think we can do that sort of thing on zoom either just put your hand up and i can see your camera or uh, if you not want to type away a question then please feel free uh, your last moment to uh shout away with with any questions um no. There, there is some lovely feedback for the lemongrass lager um, on there. So we should just let people know that we did sell out very, very quickly, but because it went so quickly, we've rebrewed it. So that one will be back in the shop in a few weeks time. Yeah, so that limited edition has become less limited, but it was so limited that we felt like we should really brew it again. Um, and uh, I've already, yeah, sort of Pre, it's amazing i mean the zero uh or this one's 0 0.5 but sort of yeah zero alcohol low alcohol i mean it is booming there's so much thirst uh for these beers if you can brew a good one it's 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 really interesting so next bit so i'm gonna um leave it there so next beer in the series to look forward to is a mango ipa uh that we're brewing with our good friends at Oddbox. uh so getting some wonky mangoes uh, and then also Flawsome, uh, who create uh, delicious juices uh, from wonky and surplus fruits as well. Um, so our two uh, friends there, uh, we are uh, putting into a, a very fruity uh, mango IPA. So look out for that one. Uh, and then if you haven't uh, tried uh, this uh, beer yet, uh, the wheat beer, then it is still on the shop. Uh, no excuses, toastale.com. And I'm just going to be a bit uh, sort of, you know, brash, offer you a cheeky uh, discount code tonight. We've got so one that's already set up, Rob. Oh, have you? So we've oh, got one perfect. that's uh, B Corp month uh, for 15% off. And I will type it into the chat. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, everyone sees bargain. Fifteen percent. I wasn't going to offer that much. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> that's uh, that's brilliant. So uh, yeah, put your orders in now. Um, and thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Henry, uh, for being a part of this with us. Uh, Hobbs House. We have brewed with your surplus bread in the past. Uh, we've brewed for this one. We will certainly be brewing with your surplus if there is any uh, in the future as well. Um, and uh, yeah, Alice uh, also from Hobbs House uh, on the call. So thank you so much. Uh, Stuart, an absolute cracker. Well done. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, Louisa uh, for uh, holding it all together 
uh, with uh, the mission at our core. Uh, really, uh, thank you so much as well. And Kristen, because you're on the call, I know you've pulled a lot of this together. Uh, a big thank you uh, to you as well. Um, all right, have a lovely evening, everyone.